Hi everybody. I would like to talk about certain charts people use in order to illustrate what happens when we're saved and what role the element of time plays in this, that is, how man experiences it in time. Before I start, please note that I will be showing a number of charts in this video, so should you just now intend to only listen to this video without looking at the screen, this is not so ideal for this particular video because I will be commenting on the different charts I'll have up on the screen. There are dozens of variations out there. As I said, I will be showing you a few in this video. Anybody who has studied at Bible school or seminary learns it this way. Every pastor will present it to you this way. The way this is being taught has great implications for the believer and I want to show what those are. In the vast majority of cases, the three columns are called justification, sanctification, and glorification, like this graphic shows, which must be read from bottom to top in terms of chronological order. According to these charts, justification happens the moment we believe, sanctification is what we are dealing with in the present, in our lives as believers, and glorification is yet future. Here's where the problem starts. Sanctification is presented as something separate from justification and, as we will see as we go on, as something that man is responsible for himself. Here's another one. Again, you have past, present and future. Again, on the left, justification and on the right, glorification. The middle is called spiritual life. Now, in the individual descriptions below, you can see that the focus is on two main aspects, on sin and on sanctification. Here you see again what is wrong with the view of sanctification because it is said to be progressive. What is meant by this is that a Christian should get more and more holy, meaning sin less and less. There is no such thing as progressive sanctification. In the next one, what is called tenses or stages is called aspects here. What happened at our conversion is described as us having been saved from the penalty of sin. Jesus bore it, so we won't be punished for our sin anymore at no time in the future. The middle tense, everything after our new birth and until death or rapture, is described as us being saved from the power of sin. Finally, once we have our glorified bodies, we won't have sin anymore. On the right, the first tense is called position, the second, condition, the third, expectation. On the left side, these tenses are matched with the terms justification, sanctification and glorification. Here's where the problem starts. As a matter of fact, there are a number of problems with these charts. The main one is that it is a man-made overdividing of what God has accomplished in our salvation. What ensues is that part of it is attributed to God and part of it to man. That is a huge problem right there. And basically the difference between walking in the spirit and walking in the flesh or being carnally minded or being a natural man between producing dead works and walking in those that God has prepared beforehand. But I'm getting ahead of myself. These charts are based on the observation that the Bible describes our position in Christ the moment that we get saved and that the salvation of our bodies is yet future and that only then we won't have the sin nature anymore. Those that say we have no more sin are liars, according to 1 John. So the whole focus is on the middle tense, the present, our life as believers here on earth. And the question is what to do with the fact that we as believers still sin. We must ask ourselves three questions here. The first, what is the focus of these charts? The second, what, according to them, is the goal of this middle tense? And third, 
how do I get there? How do I achieve this goal? Let me show you another chart and this will become more obvious visually. Again, we have justification, sanctification and glorification. And again, separation from the penalty, power and presence of sin. The arrow goes up and points to the word salvation. Now look at this chart. This is probably a coincidence, but what is striking is that at the right side of this arrow, the word sin is found in all three tenses. The attention is being drawn to sin. And this is the first big problem we're encountering with these charts. The whole focus is on sin. As if God, in saving us, is exclusively occupied with our sin. Before you protest and say, yes, of course he is, Jesus died for our sins, let me show you another chart to illustrate this point. And I will get back to the question of what God is concerned with later. So here's another example. I guess they have a typo in it right there. It should be from regeneration, not for. But anyway, here we have justification, sanctification and glorification again. And, and this is new, spirit, soul and body assigned to the three tenses. But look at the right hand side. Here we find past, present and future again. I have cut out what it says underneath there so that you can read it better. Look at this. About the first tense, the past, it says finished, completed. True. The future tense reads not yet available, waiting for God. Okay. But now look at the middle tense, the present. It says, we work here. This is the labor of our Christian life. They have betrayed themselves right there. Now, granted, the majority of the charts do not show it that way. Nor does every pastor or Bible teacher actually teach it that clearly. And yet, that is what's behind it. The Christian life is characterized by labor, is the first point. The second is that we work here. Thanks for letting us know so clearly what you're up to with these charts. Man-made doctrine. So, regarding the first question I asked earlier, the main focus is sin. And there is a distinction being made between justification, which according to these charts happens at conversion, and sanctification, which they say is what happens in the middle tense, the present. This is not true, of course, because in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30 it says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Again, there are yet others who acknowledge that and make another distinction, that between positional and practical or experiential sanctification. They say, yes, we are sanctified positionally, but that must now be put into practice in our lives. Basically, what these people are saying is that the first tense, our position, is only good for the third tense, glorification. God justified and sanctified us positionally. This will only be experienced once we get to heaven, however. While our salvation is secure, in the middle tense, we ourselves must see to it that we put it into practice now. So the first tense, the positional truth, is merely theoretical. A fact, yes, but does not have practical implications. The practical part is totally on us now. Now, one of the pastors we are currently responding to in some of our content said the following in a message on sanctification, the middle tense. It is about yieldedness and being willing to submit. We should let go of our stubbornness. Now, many of these pastors stress that there are no works required for salvation, and for this reason they strongly oppose lordship salvation, which uses phrases like submit to the lordship of Christ, give your life to Christ, etc. 
So if you heard these terms in the context of the so-called first tense, you would say, this is wrong, this is lordship salvation, no work is required in order to get saved. But for the middle tense for sanctification, all of a sudden, they are not only okay, but more than that, a requirement to get sanctified, to grow, to get blessed. Yes, that is exactly what is being taught. In the same way, this goes for the term dead works. It is being taught that those are all works one leans on in order to get saved. However, dead works still exist after that, even if the focus slightly shifts towards presenting them in order to be blessed or receive rewards or get progressively sanctified. Back to this yieldedness. What exactly does he mean by this? Well, he is quick to detail. Church attendance and tithing. The latter we should do with a good attitude. Not my will, but thine. Another one of them actually preached recently that the local church is the main tool and greatest gift in God sanctifying us in the practical sanctification. And then the congregation and online listeners are being told, quote, the quality of your walk is going to be better the more yielded you are. Now you know what they mean by this. Attend a local church and give your tithes. And then he says that if you don't yield and obey, you will be chastened. There are several attributes that are being named again and again to tell you how the so-called practical or progressive sanctification is being achieved. This would be the third question I asked earlier. They are obedience, service and discipline. One must be aware that those terms are not being used in the biblical sense, but in the following manner. Obedience means to them following orders, obeying commandments, and not the obedience of faith. Service is seen from the perspective of a servant and his master as a duty that must be performed and above all as a wage that is being earned and that by it rewards are being accumulated. Discipline is understood as a punishment for sinning too much and not as a training of a loving father. Christ bore our punishment. All these have the main goal of getting to a point where one sins as little as possible, doing as much work for the Lord as possible in order to receive as many rewards as possible. That would be my second question. What is presented as the goal of the middle tense? It is accompanied by the threat that the Lord will punish those who do not obey sin too much or not serve enough. I would like to have a quick look at the parable of the prodigal son and how it relates to these charts. It is actually a parable about a believer who is in the father's house but runs away from him and then comes back. I had mostly heard it taught, however, as a parable about the lost who come back to God. Let's look at it from this perspective for a moment. Man is separated from God, comes to his senses and finds his way to him. The son, when he arrives at the father's house, is given three things by him. A robe, a ring and sandals. The robe is the righteousness of Christ that is being imputed to us upon believing. In Isaiah 61 verse 10 it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, my soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation, he has covered me with a robe of righteousness. The ring was most likely a signet ring, it meant sonship and authority. With it, the son could make any transaction on behalf of his father and sign any document. When Pharaoh made Joseph second in line after him, we read the following. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, 
and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a golden chain around his neck. The signet ring gave him all authority to act in Pharaoh's name. We are heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. Our father is infinitely rich. We can access his riches any time. The ring is like a modern-day credit card. The sandals were also an item that distinguished the son from slaves or servants because only they wouldn't be wearing them back then. Now, what has this to do with the salvation charts, you might ask? Well, they would argue that in the first tense, justification, yes, you are given the robe. However, they don't actually give you the sandals and the ring. They treat you as a servant. Remember the one chart I showed that says, we work here, this is the labor of the Christian life? They tell you, yes, you are justified and a member of God's family. They do not actually let you in the house, however. Instead, they send you off to the field to work. No sandals. And remember, the father had more for the son. He prepared the fatted calf and had a feast for him. The charts people will tell you the feast is for later, point three, for heaven, once you're glorified. While here, what you got to do is work. Only when you've reached your retirement age, so to speak, will you be allowed to enjoy it. The older son, by the way, represents exactly what is wrong with this middle tense of salvation in these charts. He boasts of two things the father never asked of him. He says, these many years I have been serving you, I never transgressed your commandment at any time. The charts say that we should serve now, the son came from the field, and they put the focus on our sin and suggest that the goal of our Christian life is to get sin under control by obedience, by which they mean commandment keeping. It is like the prodigal son getting a bath first, but telling him, stay in there and see to it that when retirement age comes, you are as clean as possible. The bath was only the entry requirement, the start, to be able to come into the house. It wasn't an end in and of itself. Or it is like telling him, this is how your days will look like from now on. Work in the field and have a bath. To be repeated day in, day out. See to it that through your works you produce as many crops as possible and try to become cleaner and cleaner each day. No, the prodigal son didn't earn the feast, nor did he prepare it himself. He enjoyed, together with others, what the father had prepared, and that right after his moment of salvation. No mention of getting to work, instead of enjoying the feast. Now that we have seen what is wrong with how the middle tense is being described, the question asks itself, of course, how then is the correct scriptural view? In Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7, it says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. So, in the same way as we have been saved, by grace through faith, what would be the first tense in these charts, we are to continue. We are not to, like Abraham, get to work to try to make the promises come true, which will only result in us producing an Ishmael. Rather, we are to continue in faith. What should our walk be characterized by? We should be rooted, built up, and established in that faith. That means that that which we have already received by faith, we are supposed to lay hold of. What is missing in these charts? Christ is. He is said to be the author of one and three, but two is on us. Even if it is being said that it isn't really on us because we have the Holy Spirit now who enables us to keep the commandments, and I have a video on this. This is only a spiritually sounding way of saying we got, we got to do this. 
So the life of the believer is really a continuing in faith of what Christ has accomplished upon justification, exploring it and laying hold of it by faith. The effects the proponents of those charts are so concerned with, a life that isn't dominated by sin anymore and that bears fruit unto God, are really a byproduct of Christ in us, the hope of glory. 99% of those charge have, charts have this wrong, in that it is man who is called to labor in the middle tense, and by it basically earn the reward in the third tense. However, surprisingly, I have found one that gets it right. It says uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 and 2 here, and that says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, that would be uh, first tense here, and in which you stand, second tense, <clears throat> excuse me, by which you are also saved, third tense, if you hold fast, second tense, that word which I, word which I preach to you. And this is also how it's presented. As you can see, on the left-hand side, it says that it is the gospel that saves us, and the arrows go to all three tenses, that is, it has the relevance in all three. It is the main and only factor. So you see here, past salvation, you received it, the gospel. When we believed in Christ, present salvation, you have taken your stand on it. That will be today. Uh, note that at present it says we got to take our stand on the gospel, which is ultimately Jesus himself, of course, the good news of what he did. And then third here is the future salvation. You are eternally saved by it forever all the way to heaven. The middle column of all the other charts isn't presented as good news, however, rather as a burden. You got to sanctify yourself and produce good works. In light of this fact, look how ridiculous their criticism is, devoid of biblical understanding of how the Christian life is actually lived. Here's a comment I found, and David has already talked about it in depth in one of his recent videos, but let me briefly focus on two points here. It starts, they don't rightly divide between position versus condition. They will look at verses which deal with positional truths and then automatically apply them to the Christian's practical condition. How horrible! We apply what is true of us positionally and dare to apply it, or better, apply Christ to our practical life? What has the one got to do with the other? Ha ha, do you see how ridiculous this is? And then look at the last paragraph. The Bible teaches both. There are blessings which every Christian receives by virtue of being in Christ, but then there are other blessings which are conditioned upon each believer's personal faithfulness. Do you notice something? The first part is true, of course. We are blessed because we are in Christ. But look at the second part. The logic here is that there would be blessings that do not come from Christ. Yes, that is exactly what is being said here. We are the source of them, basically. They come because of our personal faithfulness. This is the overdividing of these charts. Christ is only good for the initial sanctification and for our glorification, but he plays no role in our life as a believer. Galatians 5 verse 4 describes exactly that. You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. These charts are Christless. They would deny this, saying, I haven't sought to be justified by the law, but what they do is try to be justified by, in their by it in their life, by what they call sanctification, which is what they think the rewards will be given for. No, Christ is everything, from start to finish. He is not only theoretical, in terms of our position, or a future promise, 
only in terms of heaven. No, he is also our practical walk. As it says in Galatians 2 verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Not by obedience, service, commandment keeping, church attendance, trying to sin less, if not discipline, that is presented as punishment. What a difference. All three salvation tenses have Christ as their operating system. You are free. No burden on you anymore. He bore them all. Reason to leap up in the air, like in this picture.